Great. Th th thank you so much. Th thank you. Uh, thank you, Henry and uh, Zidink for, for, for the invitation. And uh, thanks, everybody, for joining. So th this, um, this might be the, 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 the least uh, quantum talk in, in this series, but uh, I'm really, really, really happy to talk about uh, some, of the, some of the research and actually try to promote uh, this area of quantum computer um, hardware cybersecurity. So this is something I kind of started in two, two three years ago, uh, and then kind of more recently having more collaborations and sort of uh, interesting results. So I thought it's, it's very, very interesting to share with you about issues of how can we secure um, quantum computers from potential uh, different vulnerabilities. Uh, and, um, and yeah, by the way, if, um, if you have any questions, feel free to, to ask them during the talk or, or, or type in the chat window. I'm happy to to, to answer, not, not just talk for, 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 for 45 minutes. So um, I think one of the, one of the motivations to, for looking uh, at, the, at the security of quantum computers is that these machines are getting uh, bigger and bigger um, every year. So nowadays there are already you know, 100 uh, qubit machines that are available uh, from, from IBM and others. And then also there are many um, cloud-based um, cloud uh, deployments where you can access the uh, devices through the uh, through the cloud, such as IBM Quantum or um, Amazon Bracket or Microsoft Azure, all these all these uh, services let you sort of any user like myself with very little quantum computing background, you know, access the devices and run run their code. And this is just a, just a you know some more motivation that you know, I'm, I'm sure everybody's familiar with the IBM um, quantum computing roadmap. Basically, you know, you have already um, you know 100 qubit systems today, and I know they're promising you know thousand or or even you know you know, 4,000, maybe even bigger machines in, in next year or two. Uh, so there's a lot of, of course, research on, on increasing the, um, the kind of the capabilities on these computers. And as we get bigger and bigger uh, quantum computers, uh, they can be used to, you know, kind of do this use for discovery of, of, you know, new drugs, new materials. So it's kind of, there's actually sensitive information that will be processed on these machines. And then since there's a lot of, lot of you know, effort and, and money involved in designing the machines, that actually the design of, of the quantum computers themselves is sort of sensitive um, proprietary information that you might want to try to uh, protect from, uh, you know, from other, um, other people. And uh, given this kind of sensitive information and even the design being sensitive, um, unfortunately, the, there's currently really no, no security considerations in the different roadmaps. So a lot of people, or pretty much everybody focuses on, of course, making the computers bigger and better. Uh, and you know, having longer decoherence times and 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 having you no know, lower error rates, but um, I think so far people are forgetting about the security aspect. Uh, and then the motivation again for the for looking at the security is that you know these machines are are not used just by IBM or just by by Rigetti, but they're actually available as a sort of a quantum computing as a service where you know you go to these different um, cloud providers uh, and you can access you know different providers give you access to different. Um, you know, quantum processing units or, or, or backends in, in IBM's uh, terminology. And um, when you access these, these devices, such as from, from IBM or, 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 for example, Rigetti by, a, by a, um, Amazon, basically there is really no, no security consideration. So uh, malicious users can, you know, access, you know, anybody who has a credit card can, can access the, um, the machine and run any code. And, and similar to you know, early days of classical quantum computing or, or cloud-based FPGAs, there's really no check. So you can run um, any sort of code that you wish on these machines, and this code uh, could potentially be, um, be malicious and try to, you know, leak information or maybe even, you know, damage the machine. And, and also for, for the users, when you're running the code um, on, on the machine, there's really no protection from, let's say, IBM or another vendor trying to, you know, use some, you know, side channel information to kind of look at the, you look at the code and try to reverse engineer what algorithm you're, you're running. So it's not just that the, the users could be malicious, but also the, the cloud provider could be sort of curious and try to learn what circuits the, the users are, um, are running. Uh, and then just, uh, just a little bit more, more, more background on, on different ways of the, that the quantum computers can be used. And this would be useful also for discussing the, the security. So sort of um, the main, or today, basically the main use case is that there's the single tenant scenario where you have, you know, one user uh, is assigned to, to, to run on all the qubits and then the machine is, is reset and then another user in the machine is reset uh, and so forth. Uh, but also, you know, as the machines get, get, get bigger and, and better and very similar to classical um, cloud computing, you know, you eventually want to have multiple users on the, 
um, on the same machine. So you might have you know, multiple, you know, multiple users running in parallel on, on this joint set of, of qubits. And then, for example, the machine gets reset and another set of disjoint users will be running on the machine. So this will be more like a batch processing. And then sort of ultimately, uh, the, 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 the setup on the right is sort of the, the multi-tenancy that's available in classical computers today is where you know, we have multiple users running at the same time. And sometimes you know, one user continues while a, a different user finishes their job and, and a new user is loaded. So, so today, um, there is there's single tenancy. But you know, I think moving forward, it's, it's, it's pretty reasonable that ideas from classical computers will be copied and there will be need, you know, people will want to have multi-tenancy. And then with multi-tenancy, there are uh, some new, you know, sort of more, more security issues because they're, they're users that are, that are not just one after the other, but also their users running in parallel. So some of the security issues that, that we're exploring are maybe not applied today to the single tenant, but would be applied to the future uh, multi-tenant. And um, some of the security threats to, to, to quantum computers, I think, can be sort of divided into to hardware, more on the hardware side and on the, uh, on the software side. So um, on, the, on the hardware side, basically, there's some, you know, some interesting questions and other ways to protect the hardware so that it cannot be reverse engineered. So somebody cannot design, so cannot learn the design of your, um, of your chips. You know, is it possible to reverse engineer uh, a cloud-based quantum computer by running different circuits and, and how to protect against that. So again, if, if IBM or, or somebody tries to have a proprietary design that they hide, could you reverse engineer uh, something about it? And also, is, you know, is it possible to have sort of physical attacks? So one interesting aspect of classical computer security is physical attacks, where you have um, sort of physical access to the machine. And now with the quantum computers being in some sort of remote uh, data center, there are possible physical attacks. So, you know, there could, the hardware security sort of in this diagram, you know, there could be attacks on the sort of, let's say, on the, on the, on the server, on the controller, let's say on the FPGA board that's actually uh, generating the, um, the, uh, the control pulses in, in the case of the, of the superconducting qubit machines or actually on the qubits, on the qubits themselves. And um, there's also the, the security side of the, sorry, the software the security side of the quantum computer. So, Basically, for example, is there a way to detect or prevent users from running these, these certain um, algorithms or programs? Um, and then what are the cybersecurity threats that are sort of also different from, from classical computers? So on, on the software side, security, you know, you have the, the, um, the, the programs themselves that might be, might be malicious, or you have Qiskit or another, another compiler that, that could be compromised. So there could be some issues with the, with the compiler. And then eventually, you know, once the software runs on the quantum computer, um, there could be, um, you know, trying to leak information or, or disrupt the operation of the quantum computer. So I think there's both um, interesting things on the hardware side and on the software side. And, and thanks to the, you know, thanks to the cloud-based access, actually, we can, we can start exploring sort of, especially the software side where you run, you know, you can sort of submit different circuits to the, to the IBM cloud and then sort of analyze them. So um, it's quite, you know, the, the you know, uh, the cloud-based access makes it very, um, very easy. Uh, and then just to kind of um, put, put, you know, this research in context of all sort of existing work out there. So I think the, the main thing that when you say, you know, quantum computer uh, and security, I think one of the main things that people will think of is, for example, uh, post-quantum uh, cryptography where, you know, where, you know, we use a quantum computer to basically try to attack some algorithms that are running on classic computers. So I think um, pretty much all of the you know, quantum computer security research really focuses on, on, on ways that you, know, you could use you know, quantum computer to, um, to attack classical computers. Uh, and then um, I also recently you know, heard people use you know, quantum computer security to sort of des describe you know, um, the, the quantum key distribution where you, where you send the, 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 the key between different machines or um, quantum to random number generation. So these are some different topics that are lumped together under um, sort of the security. But um, our research and sort of the, the area I'm trying to promote is, is sort of looking at what are the threats to the quantum computer. So how could you, how could somebody, you know, attack a quantum computer hardware? And then of course, how to uh, defend from those, from those attacks. And, um, and then so, you know, in this context, in, in the rest of the talk, I kind of, kind of mentioned some interesting research and, and hopefully motivate some, some collaboration between hardware, you know, security and quantum, uh, quantum um, researchers. 
Uh, and then I'll talk about um, fingerprinting of quantum computers, uh, fingerprinting of the quantum computer um, in, uh, infrastructure, so sort of the whole, whole data center that's holding the quantum computers. Um, and I also talk a bit about um, information leaks across reset gates, which is one of our recent works. Uh, and then also talk about some initial ideas for, uh, for defenses. And then I'll end with more, maybe more, more, more futuristic, but I think really cool um, ideas about physical attacks um, on quantum computers. So, so yeah, feel, feel free when I talk about these different topics, feel free to, <laughs> to interrupt if, if you have some, some questions. But, but the first thing I, I want to talk about is about uh, fingerprinting. So um, in, in hardware, hardware security, basically the idea of fingerprinting is to kind of find some unique uh, piece of um, you know, information about the hardware that can identify the, the piece of hardware. And it's basically, or it's often based on some, some analog features of the hardware and especially some manufacturing variation. So even though you, know, you have the same, you know, same smartphone, it's the same model of the smartphone or the same model of the, of the memory, um, there are manufacturing variations that make, it, make each unit kind of unique. And then the, the fingerprinting is basically a way of trying to extract those unique, uh, unique features. So you have, so you have so the hardware and you try to extract the characteristics and then you have the fingerprint just like a human has a fingerprint. Uh, and then the fingerprint can be used for many, many interesting things. The least, you know, not least of them kind of just identifying the hardware. So if you, if you go to a cloud provider in classical computers, for example, you rent a virtual machine, but there's no, there's no serial number, you can't identify it. And if you're able to fingerprint some piece of hardware, um, that, the, that the virtual machine is running on, then now you have a unique way of identifying that hardware. And then similar with quantum computers, you know, okay, right now, um, a lot of the information is disclosed to the users because people are still learning how to use these algorithms. And then IBM, for example, provides a lot of metadata and, you know, even that, you know, each machine has a unique name. But, but in the future, they might just give you a quantum computer without any serial number or any way to identify it. So we might want to have a fingerprint to to identify the machines. And um, there's, there's sort of out of negative aspects that you can identify and can see how many machines they have by finding the unique fingerprints, but you can also use it for positive things like reliability. So for example, if the cloud, if the cloud provider says, I am giving you access to two different um, quantum computers, you know, you can use the fingerprint to indeed confirm that these are two different ones and they're not trying to to cheat you and just put you on the same machine. And, and then sort of if that, that machine fails, then, then you know, your, your computation fails. So, uh, so you want to have fingerprinting to identify which machines. And um, as, a, as a kind of example from classical computers and some other work that we've done before, for example, we've used DRAM-based um, physical and clonable functions uh, or paths for, for fingerprinting. And, and very briefly, um, DRAM memories, um, if you write some data to the DRAM memory, and you turn off the refresh rate, you, it decays. And basically the, the way that the charges decay in the DRAM depend on the manufacturing variations of the, of the capacitors and the transistors in the, in the DRAM memory. So you can have this sort of unique fingerprint. So even though you have identical models of the memories, let's say these memory A and B will have this different decay pattern and that can be used to as a fingerprint. Uh, and then for example, you can, Set, disable the decay for some time t, and then observe the the uh, the patterns that decayed, and then you can use some metrics such as Chicard index to decide if you know if you get the set of uh, locations that have decayed. You know if if you do this multiple times on different devices, you can use Chicard index to identify if this is the same memory or or a different memory. And just as a sort of a motivation, and then sort of some cool things that you can do in classical computers, uh, for example. You know, if we do this on the FPGA-based um, cloud computing, we could have the, the fingerprint of the DRAM modules of the FPGAs. And just as an example, you know, the fingerprint from, so the intra device is the fingerprint from the same device. So if you, if you collect the fingerprint from the same device multiple times, it's, it's not always exactly the same, but in general, they have similar, very high similarities so that your card index is close to one. And if you compare the fingerprints from, from different devices, um, then the, the Jacquard index is um, close to zero, so you can identify that these are different devices. And so some, some different interesting security things that you can do with this, for example, by, by, by measuring, by renting um, a, a virtual machine with a, a PGA, you can, uh, for example, get the fingerprint and, for example, identify the way they, they do the scheduling. So for example, uh, you know, 
if you, this is the graph showing that what's the probability of getting the same FPGA. So if you rent an FPGA, you, you, you're done with it, and then you rent it again, um, you can see that in, in some cases, there is even you know, close to 50% probability that you end up on the same physical FPGA. So that's kind of very interesting, and we can learn about the scheduling of how the, you know, even though it's secret how Amazon schedules the machines, you can learn um, some, something about their, their scheduling. And for example, the, the DRAM decay has some temperature effect, so you can sort of also have like a remote uh, temperature measurements you can measure, you know, without any access by looking at the DRAM decay rates, you can have, you can measure the, the, de the temperature sort of in the remote data center where this, where this computer is running. So you can learn a lot about the uh, infrastructure. Um, and then so with, with, with these ideas, we try to uh, come up, is there a way to fingerprint um, uh, quantum computers and kind of what, what features of the quantum computers could be used for, uh, for fingerprinting? And uh, one, one of the early works that we did um, uh, a year or two ago, we looked at um, idle tomography. So um, idle tomography is used to characterize different um, crosstalk error rates, but actually you can um, use the, the results from the IDT to find uh, a device specific patterns in the, in the error rates and use the results of the IDT as a, as a sort of a, a fingerprint. So we, we did a lot of um, IDT measurements and then collected the data and then tried to extract some um, interesting features. And based on the, on the IDT measurements, uh, you can uh, basically yeah, you can identify, again, you have this inter and intradistance where uh, you can identify whether you know, it's the same machine or it's a different machine uh, looking at the, at the IDT results. So you have uh, just a measurements from, a, let's say, a, a five qubit machine. You can try to compare the IDT from the two machines and or multiple action machines and then you know, distinguish whether it's from the same machine or not. But some, uh, some challenges is that the fingerprinting takes uh, quite a bit of time and it requires some post, you know, some post processing to extract these features. So we've been trying to look at other ways to, to make it some, some simpler fingerprint that, that's accessible. And we looked at, at, at different things like the, you know, at the T1 and T2 times, the readout error or the, or the gate errors. But as you can see on these graphs for, for different, um, for different um, uh, quantum processing units or for different, different backends, so these are different IBM machines, you can see that you know the different T1 times, T2 times, and the, and the errors. They also they have sort of similar um, similar ranges of values. So these these things are not 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 so useful as a basis for a fingerprint. But but one thing that seems to be kind of promising um, as a as a stable fingerprint is actually the frequencies of the qubit. So um, so this is just a graph showing the the the, the historical data for, for one of the IBM backends, and you can see that the the frequency of the qubits is actually pretty pretty stable um, over time, and then if you look at at different different machines, you can see that you know for different machines, even though let's say they have um, uh, five uh, five qubit machines, the frequencies of the qubits within the machine, um, you know, of course within the machine, of course they're they're different to minimize different different crosstalks and errors, but also among the machines, they they don't they you know they don't seem to have the same frequency for the different qubits. So um, you can kind of create this, this, this graph where you look at the you know, different machines. So the letter is the, is the machine, um, and then the, the number is the, is the qubit of that machine. And then you can see that for, you know, uh, for, the, for the, same, uh, you know, for the same, same machine and the same qubit, they have the very same um, frequency. So, the, so it's close to, so then this metric, and the similarity metric is close to zero. Uh, and then the other ones are quite uh, quite dissimilar. So across you know different machines, it's very unlikely that you have the same uh, uh, frequency. Um, yeah, good question about the cycle. Yeah, so here um, here the uh, uh, it's the calibration cycle, or it's basically um, the the data that the the IBM provides. I, I believe the data is updated once a day for the for the for the um, for the um, for the frequency. So I think the calibration is actually much more, much more frequent every maybe up to even two hours uh, these days, but the historical data is, is provided roughly once, once a day. So this, this sort of this calibration cycle really means one historical data for them. So is uh, that uh, around two, uh, one year of uh, data? So um, 500 cycles. Yeah, so, so um, I, th I think I have some more graphs later. So, so it will be a couple of months, a yeah, couple of yeah. months up to, up to a year. I think maybe the longest machine has been online is like a year and a half or something like that. 
yeah, so mm. it's quite 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 long. So uh, so this might this actually this might be yeah uh, yeah few few months. Uh, there's some interesting longer term patterns that I can talk about also in the next one. And then um, and then so so to to create the fingerprint based on the frequencies, we can basically define the fingerprint as just a, as a vector of the of the five you know of the of the frequencies of of the qubits, and then basically we can uh, define the similarity as a as a simple simple metric is that you know the given given vectors of the of the same size um, how many uh, frequencies are different and so so since since each measurement that the frequency is not it's, there's small variation so we set some um, some some threshold some average above which we decide if, whether the frequency is the same or if it's different and then this is over the number of of qubits and with uh, with this metric we can see that you know across different calibration cycles um, for the same for the same machine, it, it remains um, similar. So um, across different calibrations, like we have high similarity, but across different machines, you get quite a different. You know, so if you get uh, the vectors of frequencies from different machines, um, you can quite easily identify that it's a different. You know, whether it's the same or different uh, different machines. So th just looking at the frequencies can be a very simple um, simple fingerprint, uh, and then also. Uh, the, you know, the calibration data can be from, from historical data, but if for some reason IBM cuts you off from the historical data, you can yourself run a, a frequency sweeping circuit to, to get the frequency of the qubit. So users could collect the frequency data themselves without relying on the, on the historical data. Um, and so, so it's kind of, you know, so the frequency can be a very easy fingerprint, uh, but there's some, a lot of research challenges and kind of, you know, how to expand it. So for example, you know, if there Tunable qubit architectures, where of course the um, the, uh, the the qubit frequencies can be tuned, so this might not be applicable. And then you know, if IBM cuts off enough access that you can't even do this frequency sweep circuit, then that's a um, that could be one sort of um, challenge or, or defense against doing the the fingerprinting. But I in, but I think you know, but if, if they cut it off, then there may maybe other features. Maybe you have to go back to the IDT as the as the way of of, of fingerprinting. Um, and um, so this is for, for one, one, one machine. And then now kind of looking more at the, at the whole, um, whole, whole, let's say, call it, let's call it the data center. So um, one thing that we also might be interested in is just how the, how the machines are used in general, how the, you know, what's the, um, you know, let's say how often the machines are, are reset or what's the maybe, what's the occupancy of the, of the data center or, you know, is, is there any patterns from, from, from what the, what uh, you know? What the machines are doing within the data center, and um, some 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 things that are kind of interesting that that we've been looking at is that in the in the very long term, so over over longer term months, uh, the device frequency actually can can change, uh, but it doesn't change um, due to sort of usually it doesn't change due to no operation, but it changes when you when you warm up the device. So if you turn off the device turn off the fridge and do some modification to the quantum computer and then turn the fridge back on, there's typically some uh, frequency change. So uh, we got some, one of our local collaborators, you know, kind of provided some data from, from the computers here at, at, at IDL. And you can see from this data that, you know, whenever there's a, a warm up cycle where, you know, where they're doing some change or even just warming up and, and cooling down the fridge, there's a jump um, in the frequency. And then um, I think this was like a, transmon device and one of the graphs is for like a squid device so it's so for, for different super com super computing qubit art and the designs warming up of the device actually uh, causes a, a abrupt change um, in the frequency uh, and then based on this we can actually look at the at the very long uh, long term um, data so this is some some more data that that we collected from from the historical data from IBM and uh, you can also you can see that some some very interesting features in, in the very long term data. For example, you know many devices have some uh, frequency shift at, at at about five months of operation. So five months since the machine is online, uh, it you know not not all of them, but a lot of them have some change in the in the frequency. Um, and then also around you know around ten months, um, there's also um, you know some changes in the frequencies in a lot of the, the machines. So there might be some interesting things you learn about, you know, IBM taking their machines offline every few months to, to service them, for example. Uh, uh, and then, so this is, this is sort of other, uh, other way of, of, of showing the, the graph. So for example, this figure showed the data since, 
uh, days when one of so IBM Lima was was online. So so the the three machines uh, came online the same day, um, according to the to the public data from IBM. Uh, and then you can see that they're sort of synchronized. That again, since the machines come online, they're they're sort of synchronized. And when the frequencies change, there might be some you know maybe maybe all of the machines are in the same fridge, and the, the fridge was for example warmed up at the same uh, at the same day. And then similarly for for like for example Lagos and Nairobi, which came came online to, you know the same day, and again um, you know they're having the same. Uh, at the same time, they have this frequency change. So you can maybe, for example, reverse engineer that even though these are um, separate quantum computers, maybe they're located in, in one in the same fridge. And, and actually, uh, very recently, I think there was a, some news from IBM. They have this huge fridge that like a whole person can fit in it. So, so, so the interesting thing is that if the machines are in the same fridge, then that's a single single point of failure. That you know, if if you're um, you know, if, if the fridge fails or something happens, all of the quantum computers in that fridge will be will be basically offline. So for reliability purposes, you know, you might want to ask IBM to give you quantum computers from, from different different fridges so there's no single point of failure. And you could use, you know, this, this data from, for example, from the frequency shifts to kind of verify or, or confirm that indeed it seems that these are not, you know, these are not being warmed up at the same time. So they're, you know, they're in a physically different um different fridge um, but you know there are a lot of challenges you know large noise in the calibration data uh and then of course we, we don't know what what ibm is really doing so it's a bit of a speculation so so it'd be you know really interesting to collaborate with industry and and can you you know can you actually you know correlate this to to actual physical events in their um in their in their data centers um, so this sort of sort of this so this fingerprinting and then looking at the properties of the machines can reveal some things about the machines themselves or about the operation of the data center, which can tell you, like for example, the machines are located in the same uh, same fridge um, or not. Um, and yeah, and then now now to maybe sort of jump to a to a, a, a different topic if, if if there are no no questions. Um, some other things that we've kind of been looking at is more at the information leaks. So. Um, the first part was more maybe about learning about the infrastructure. Uh, this is more about something that one user could try to do to another user to, to learn, uh, learn, for example, what's happening on the computation um, on, the, on these machines. And um, very recently, we've been looking especially at the reset gates. So, so for the um, IBM machines, uh, you, can, you have a reset gate that it's, it's, an, it's an active um, reset gate that basically resets the state of the qubits to, to zero. A cat ideally, and and then one of the benefits is that it's much faster than like a full full system wipe. So if you want to in the future, if you want to have, um, and of course the full system wipe resets all the qubits together, whereas the reset gate resets one qubit. So if you want to have a um, a, a, a multi tenant quantum computer in the future, you know having a, a reset gate is very important so that you know few qubits can be reset before another another user um, is running. And then, so we have to make sure that such a reset gate um, is secure. Uh, and then, so for today's, for the existing reset gates, basically you have a, a, a measurement where you measure the state of the qubit. Uh, and then conditionally, you know, if, if the state is measured to be one, it, is, it applies an X gate to flip the state back to, back to zero. And it can be, you know, few um, uh, microseconds to, to execute the, the, the reset gate. And as a, as a, Interesting, I don't know, maybe not interesting, but this is just a small anecdote. You know, we thought there might be a, a very obvious a timing attack where the duration of the reset gate, um, basically, so if you don't need to ex execute the X gate, the reset gate could be, could be shorter and, and um, that could improve the performance, but it will be a, a really obvious timing attack where by measuring the execution of the reset gate, you could learn, you know, whether, whether, the, whether it had to reset the qubit or not. But, but fortunately, uh, IBM did a good job here that, that the execution of the reset gate seems to be constant time. So regardless of whether you have to apply the X gate or not, it is um, it executes in the same time. So there's no no obvious um, timing attack. So that that's that's it's kind of a good good security practice from uh, from uh, from IBM. Um, and like I said, it, the reset gate could be in the middle of a circuit to reset a few qubits between uh, different users. Execute. Um, however. Um, if the reset gate does not work correctly, then 
um, basically you have you have two problems. Either um, if if there's some circuit before the victim and then the reset doesn't work correctly, then the, there could be an incorrect state at the beginning of the computation. So typically when a circuit starts up, you assume that all the qubits are, are in the zero state and then you sort of prepare your, the state that you need for your computation. But if the, if the initial state is incorrect, then that could affect the computation of the circuit. Or when a circuit finishes, if you, if you again, if the reset doesn't work correctly, um, then you could leak some information about the final state of the prior, prior circuit. So you could leak uh, what are basically the result of the, of the prior user's um, execution. Um, and, then, uh, and then actually, so what we did, we, we analyzed the, the reset gates and we found that indeed there might be some, some issues with the reset gates. So especially, so, you know, if, for example, you know, before reset, you know, again, just if it's, um, if it's zero or, or, or one. And so then in ideal case, in both cases, the, the final state of the, of the qubit is, is, is zero kept after the reset. But what we found is that basically the actual reset, um, there is, if, if the, if the prior state is, is zero, then it works, for, let's say, correctly or perfectly. But if the, the state of the qubit is not zero, then after you apply the reset state, is actually not fully reset to the, to the zero state, yet, but has some, um, some you know, mixtures of, of states. It's very close, but, but not perfect. Uh, and um, so, so to, to demonstrate um, this, uh, this, 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 this issue, basically we looked at um, a victim circuit where, um, sorry, the, the x-axis is not showing. So, so, the, so the x-axis is the, is the theta angle. So, so if theta is, is zero, then you have the, the zero state. If the theta is pi, then you have uh, one ket, so you have one state, and sort of everything in between is some state um, in, in between. And then we looked at what is, the, what is the measurement after, you know, without reset gates, after one reset gate, after replying two, three, four, and, and so forth. And what you can see is that uh, you can see that the, the, the y-axis, the magnitude uh, here, uh, here, uh, here, of course, is, is much less, but even after applying um, one, you know, one reset, two reset, and, and, and so forth, it's still the, the, mag the, the probability of, of, of measuring, so this is actually, so this is the probability of measuring one post reset. So the probability of measuring one actually is not, is not flat, but it depends on the, on the theta angle of the, of, the, of the qubit before the reset. So effectively what this means is that um, what, if the victim had a, had a zero state or, or a one state, even if you apply um, one or more reset gates, you can still recover that state. So this is a basically a, a, a information leakage. It, it, might not, it might not be enough to affect the operation of the next circuit. So um, the sort of the, the noise affecting the next circuit is not, maybe not the issue, but if, if in, in, this, in the second case of, of somebody trying to leak, leak the information and spy on the previous user, they can have a simple re circuit that just measures, you know, the only thing is that basically just measures the state right after you start. And then you can, if you know which qubit and which machine you're on, then you can basically recover the, the, the state um, of, you know, you, or not, not the full state, but basically approximate whether it was, you know, a zero or a one or, or somewhere in between for the, before the reset. And while we were doing this, um, actually, there was also some interesting observation. You can see that in the Perth machine, um, it seems that the reset actually was not working. Uh, and uh, just some, some other experiments for some other things we're looking at in, in general, it seems that Perth is, is a weird, weird machine. Uh, so, but one feature was that the reset doesn't seem to be working. And, um, you know, actually we talked to IBM about this and um, like they, they, they're very kind and they kind of look at, you know, kind of accept information, but they sort of can't really tell you much about the, the machines. But indeed, um, after talking to them in, 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 I think in July this summer, the perf machine was offline for, for some time. So, so maybe, they're, <laughs> maybe they're trying to fix the, the reset or some issues. So, so in addition to just the security analysis, you might find some, some issues with, the, um, with, with things like the reset. So, so we demonstrated that there is some problem with the reset gate that, and, and actually we have a CCS paper that's coming up in next, next month that also proposes sort of a, a secure reset that doesn't, um, doesn't necessarily, that doesn't make, you know, it's, it's not a perfect output, but it, it introduces some randomization so that if you do a measurement post the secure reset, you no longer can correlate whether, you know, it, it might not be zero, uh, but, 
you, you can't correlate it to the state before the uh, before the reset. Um, um, okay, so um, yeah, so this is kind of you know about the, the reset gates and some some issues with the with the reset gates and may, maybe in the remaining time um, I, I I can I I'll have to skip some of the slides but I can talk very briefly about some defenses. So in addition to attacking the quantum computers, of course, we want to actually make them safer and better. So what are some possible uh, defenses? And um, one, um, one thing that we've kind of been exploring, and actually um, Henry uh, has been part of this collaboration, is looking at different uh, quantum computer uh, viruses and then uh, sort of proposing an, an antivirus. So um, basically, a, a quantum computer virus, you could define sort of as any circuit that's running on a quantum computer that's used to steal information or disrupt operation. So it's not, it's not trying to do useful computation, but it's just trying to do something uh, malicious. And then it could be um, a, a gate level um, uh, circuit uh, or a virus that, that's defined using just the predefined gates or the pulse, le pulse level virus that's defined using custom, custom pulses. And um, I guess now IBM sort of, um, you know, maybe this distinction is less important because IBM is allowing a lot of the pulse level control for, for all the users. So, so this distinction may be less, less important in, in recent months, but still you could have at, at the different, different levels that, that the viruses. Um, and some, some potential viruses could look at crosstalk and information leakages, or for example, some power viruses that maybe try to consume a lot of, a lot of power and, and disrupt the operation of the, of the quantum computer. Um, and then, and the, the, where this is most important, it would be sort of a multi-tenant quantum computers, because you know, in multi-tenant quantum computers, you have one user running on, on two qubits, and then on adjacent qubits, you have another user. So this might not apply to IBM or other machines today, but in the future, uh, this would be very, uh, very important if you have multiple users on different, different qubits. And so, you know, if you have one, one user next to a, uh, to a victim, uh, they could generate some crosstalk and affect the operation. Uh, and the malicious circuit could be some, some circuit, like for example, bunch of CNOT gates that generate a lot of crosstalk and noise, and it doesn't do any useful computation, but it, it does, it tries to generate a lot of interference. Um, so, and we've been doing some experiments to show that, that these, these malicious circuits could, could degrade the performance of the, of the adjacent uh, victim circuit. And um, I don't have time, but we, we try to explore different circuits. Um, a lot of them focus on using CNOT gates to, to create the interference. And also a lot of them uh, include some, you know, very small delay between the gates, which prevents the KISS kit from optimizing them out. So, so of course, you know, adjacent CNOT gates are, don't make any sense. So KISS kit would normally optimize them out, but you can sort of trick it by adding, like, you know, just one or even zero delay, just some very minimal delay between the CNOT gates, then it no longer will try to optimize out the um, the, the adjacent CNOT gates. Uh, and then we, we did some experiments with different uh, victim circuits. And then by running an adjacent malicious circuit, you can show that the output probability is, um, is decreased or is changed for the malicious circuit. And for like for Grovers, um, it's decreased, but maybe you can't um, flip the decision. But for, for like for Dojoza, for example, you can actually maybe flip that, which is the, the output value uh, that has higher um, higher probabilities here. So, uh, so there are different circuits have are, are different affected differently, and to sort of to so so to kind of try to prevent execution of the circuits, um, you could of course try to do something at runtime. But one idea we had to propose is to use the compiler and create like an antivirus. So very similar to a, to a classical computer, um, since you know since the viruses are are basically um, uh, programs um, quantum computer programs then. You could, you know, as, as you have the compiler running and, and analyzing the, the, the program and generating the, uh, the, the, the pulse schedule, at the same time, it's time to try to look for some, some malicious patterns. And uh, one way, you know, unlike a classical virus where you sort of look for sequences of, of, of instructions, for a quantum computer, we could, uh, you know, we could represent uh, a quantum computer uh, a circuit and also a quantum computer virus as, as a graph. And then what you can do is you can basically search for, you can use um, a subgraph isomorphism to see given some input circuit within that circuit or within that graph, is there another circuit or another subgraph that represents one of these, uh, you know, one of these malicious, malicious circuits. And then if you, within the, within the circuit that a user is trying to compile, if you find a, find a malicious circuit, then of course you could disallow 
you know, execution or you say, you know, I cannot compile this circuit or, or do something like that. And since these malicious circuits might be, you know, nonsensical circuits that normal users don't want anyway, this shouldn't, you know, hopefully the, the false positive rate is quite low and we don't mark uh, actual uh, normal benign programs as, as malicious. Uh, and then just, you know, just so to, again, to compare, you know, for classical computers, you're usually looking at assembly instructions and try to identify some, some, some patterns or, or pattern matching on, on strings on identifying the instructions. But for, you know, for gate level uh, antivirus, you need to look at the, at the gates and maybe look like the, uh, represent the circuits as, as graphs and analyze the graph structure. And then of course, if you do a post level antivirus, then maybe you have to look at the, at the train of the pulses, um, and, and try to some, somehow do, you know, some, you know, do some um, matching in terms of, you know, do these pulses represent like normal, meaningful gates or could these be sort of malicious pulses? So I think there's a lot of work on, you know, how to, how to design the antivirus and how to really pattern match. Uh, and then one, one of actual challenges is too is, is demonstrating these viruses. So because the, the current computers have very short decoherence time, it makes it, difficult to, to almost impossible to run like a, you know, big realistic victim circuit. And then if you don't run this, you know, realistic circuit, or, or if you don't run it for long enough, the crosstalk also doesn't have time to, to take an effect. So, so, so far there are some issues that, you know, you know, a lot, you know, a lot of the, the crosstalk is kind of intermixed with decoherence and it's hard to analyze how, how, how malicious the, the circuits could really be. So, um, you know, um, as, as, but as, as quantum computers get better, you have longer decoherence time that actually can be bad because you can have more time for the attacker to, to run in parallel to the user and, and cause some, cause some um, interference. Um, so I, 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 think, um, I think maybe there's, there's very little time. So um, I, maybe I'll, I'll skip this, this last part, um, but um, I, you know, one, one thing that, that I'll not talk about, but it's interesting is, is physical. Uh, physical attacks, so basically physical attacks involve actually some getting near, near the target machine and causing some power or, or electromagnetic um, variations that could affect the, the operation of the, of the computer. And one of the sort of um, powerful things about physical attacks is that it's, it's more powerful than sort of software or, or code-based attacks. But the, 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 the cons is that you need physical, physical access. But as a, as, a, as a really, you know, I know this is Maybe, maybe a little bit too too extreme, but this is uh, actually a, a picture of of a of a of a of a quantum computer uh, setup that um, you know maybe a lot of you might have in, in your own research labs. You have like you know you have like a, a fridge, um, and then you know there's the uh, cables, and then there's classical uh, control logic, and then so um, you know if somebody gets into the into the into the room where the quantum computer is held, so like if you're into the data center, um, you could actually be um, able to um, you know, maybe cause some interference by having a transmitter. And um, one, one thing um, that, that maybe is, is a little bit too extreme, but if, if you ever come to Yale, um, so this is uh, actually a, a public picture from, from one, of the, one of the startups here on campus. And um, actually uh, the, the other side is, is a walkway that, that I walk to work that happens to be um, outside of the building. And if you look at, you know, if you look at the public picture from the website, you can actually see this power pole. So you can actually very easily find out that you know, this quantum computer is actually here on the, on the, on the second floor, you know, you know 10, 10 or 20 meters away from the walkway. So you could have somebody actually outside of the, outside of the building, you know, could be actually trying to cause interference uh, and then could cause some, some issues for the machine. So I'm sure IBM um, has more, more, more physical security in place, but, you know, at, at least for, for, for this example, it's actually, you know, you might not know about it, but you're within very short physical distance of the fridge and the, and the quantum computer. So, um, so with that, maybe, maybe I can skip um, to just kind of, kind of wrap up is that, again, a lot of research on quantum computers and, and, and security focuses more, mostly on post-quantum cryptography and quantum key distribution and, and things like that. Whereas I'm, I'm trying to promote research on looking how can we protect quantum computers themselves and then all these different uh, security uh, security issues and um, you know one one kind of motivation why are we why are we um, interested in this and when one thing you know some some motivations are basically quantum computers can generate some results like find new new chemical compounds or, or or new drugs that are not possible with classical computers so there is sensitive information that that will be on these computers that and then once you have sensitive information 
then you need to you know protect it so nobody can can kind of uh, can kind of steal it. Um, you could you know also there could be manipulation or loss of data, so it's bad you know bad for the bad for 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 an for a business if if somebody you know runs a malicious circuit and other users get get wrong results from their uh, from their computation. Or you know somebody might try to reverse engineer the, the actual quantum computer. So a lot of a lot of research is spent on designing these machines. So if the design is proprietary, then um, you know uh, somebody could leak it and kind of learn your design. And so you have to kind of protect um, that part. And of course, um, you know maybe not not less less for researchers, but for real companies. You know if you have a big headline about you know a security leak uh, in your company, that can cause a lot of a lot of issues and loss of just reputation. So you know. Even though may, there may be not no attacks yet, the companies I think should protect themselves from just looking bad if, if somebody if something happens. Um, and uh, you know some potential for uh, for you know you know kind of future work and kind of collaboration and, and things to look at. Uh, you know a lot of you know can apply a lot of ideas from classical computers to quantum computers. So for example, how do we do? You know, we looked at the, the viruses, but there could be for example other things: uh, denial of service, um, zero day attacks. I, I skipped the physical attacks, but also that's a that's a direct application from uh, from classical uh, classical uh, information, and there's sort of some challenges and potential at, at, at Yale and, and other universities. You know, is the nice thing is that we, if we talk to quantum computer researchers, we might get um, get get access to the mis- machines and can kind of look at the actual physical machines and and kind of learn about their operations and how to protect them and. Um, you know, one of the challenges also is that people maybe think it's a little bit too early to think about it. But as you can see, IBM is is already deploying and 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 Rigetti and uh, Quantum Circuits Inc. and and other ones are are deploying these machines. So it's not 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 too early because they're already out there connected to the um, to the internet. 